Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, great. All right, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Mark. I am the sales team lead for Apps Flyer uh, across Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, before we get started, can I just get a round from the audience? Like, how many people here develop mobile games? All right, so we got a couple. And have you guys heard of Apps Flyer before? All right, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Apps Flyer is, uh, we are a mobile attribution and marketing analytics platform. Essentially, what this means is that we help developers understand where are their installs coming from, how much do they spend to acquire those users through their marketing campaigns, and what are those users doing post-install? Are they purchasing uh, content, or are they purchasing items? Are they registering for an account? Are they actually playing different levels throughout the game? Now, we work with over 85,000 marketers and developers globally and measure over one trillion actions per month. And this kind of scale of data gives us a lot of insights into where we see mobile ad fraud globally and how we can then protect our clients against mobile ad fraud to help save their budget um, and clean up their data to make sure that they're making the best decisions possible. So we are trusted globally by the biggest companies in the world. Um, and not only non-gaming, but also a lot of gaming uh, studios globally use AppsFlyer not just for attribution, but also for fraud protection. Uh, for example, Playrix, Minecraft, um, Roblox, Fortnite, um, as well as many, many studios here in Australia as well. Now, when we talk about mobile ad fraud, what we're really talking about is bad actors or fraudsters that are faking clicks, impressions, or even installs and in-app actions to try to claim some of your marketing budget. And globally, we estimated in Q1 this year, um, that impact was about 650 to 750 million dollars. Now, a lot of people think that most fraud probably comes from China, and you're halfway right. Most of the fraud that we see comes from APAC as a whole, but it's not limited to just China or uh, regions such as Indonesia, but actually, um, what, where we see a lot of fraud is also in regions that have high CPIs as well as volume. So mobile advertisers are not really safe anywhere that they're acquiring users um, unless they're really in a very, very low CPI market. Now when we look across APAC, it's really important to also understand where we're seeing fraud. Um, so today what I'm going to be showing you is a couple of insights across verticals for how much fraud impacts marketers. Um, and then also diving into the different types of fraud we see and what you can do to protect yourself. So across APAC, when we look at user acquisition here, we see that the average fraud rate is about 22%. 22% of installs that you acquire end up being fraudulent. Now, you can see that this is actually skewed heavily because for gaming, it's much less. Only about 4.8% of users acquired on gaming um, tend to be fraudulent in APAC. However, when we look at different verticals, entertainment, travel, shopping, and especially finance, those fraud rates go all the way up to almost 50%. One in two users that you're paying for if you're a finance app, uh, on average, is fraudulent. Now for gaming, both in APEC, but also for users acquired in, well, that's not working anymore. Also for users acquired in Australia and New Zealand, um, gaming tends to, we, we tend to see the lowest amount of fraud in gaming. And this is because, of course, low CPIs for gaming, much lower than all the other verticals. However, the volume for gaming is also much larger. And so when you take into context how many users you might be acquiring, um, and also when you're looking at acquiring users outside of Australia and New Zealand, especially in high growth markets like Singapore, uh, Japan, um, the US even, um, you can expect that you know, th this 0.5% or the up to 5% of fraud can actually start eating up quite a large part of your budget. And if you are developing hyper-casual games, every little bit of margin matters. And so that 5% of fraud can, comp uh, can have a massive impact on your marketing budget, and more importantly, also on your data. So why is this relevant for people here in the room? We've got a few mobile game developers. Um, not sure what everybody else here in the room does. But when you look at mobile gaming, and especially here in Australia, um, there's been quite a big change in how you can expect to acquire users. In the past, a lot of studios relied on building really beautiful games and getting a feature from Google Play or from the App Store. And those features drove a lot of downloads, a lot of organic users who tend to be very high performance as well. But th those times have changed. And 
um, the Google Play Store and App Store no longer look at install numbers to help determine what should be featured. And the way that they feature apps as well is very different. And the moment that you're on that home page on the App Store is limited to only a day, for example. And so what we've seen talking to developers globally, but also here in Australia and New Zealand, is that when they get features, the impact of that on their user acquisition, on the amount of users that, they, that install their app, is dramatically less than it used to be two, three years ago. And so in order to build a sustainable business around your mobile game, you need to actively invest in marketing. You need to acquire users. And you need to be able to do that safely without wasting your marketing budget on fraudulent actors. So how, is, how does fraud work? And what, are the, what is it made up of? Um, we'll go into details about all the different types of fraud in a second, but I just want to show you what you're up against if you're looking at acquiring users in APAC, and specifically in Australia and New Zealand as well. Now, across APAC, there are two dis uh, prominent types of fraud, bots and install hijacking. Now, bots are completely faked installs. In many cases, there are no actual devices. These are just server-side scripts that are faking data to attribution providers to uh, pretend that there was an install, pretend that there are in-app events, so that you would then pay out that publisher via whatever ad network you're using. Install hijacking is quite different. Install hijacking actually um, are real users. These are actual people who are installing your app, but through fraud, they're being attributed to the wrong source. And this is usually due to a fake click that's injected or um, pushed at some point in that user's journey prior to the first launch. Now in A and Z, Bots are actually the most prominent type of fraud that we see. Over 60% of fraud <clears throat> that we've measured for users acquired in this country um, were bots. And the second largest at 20% device farms. Now device farm is kind of your typical idea of what fraud might look like. Really big room, hundreds or even thousands of devices constantly uh, creating real clicks, real installs, and then resetting their device IDs. So these are actual real devices but there's no real human user behind them. So the impact of fraud is not only on your marketing budget. Yes, it is significant. 23% of global ad spend is wasted on fraud. But also, fraud is always evolving, and it's becoming more and more sophisticated. So we see that year on year, uh, the amount of fraud is growing about 30%. And currently, over 74% of fraud is what we call sophisticated types of fraud, much more uh, complex than they were in the past. In the past, most fraud was just click-based fraud, which was very quite easy to, to execute. And so as fraud evolves, you also need to evolve your fraud protection using data and machine learning to better understand and better find these patterns uh, to be able to prevent that type of fraud. Now, apart from just the financial impact, there's also the impact on your app data. Many developers rely on their data in order to produce better products, make adjustments to their products, and also make adjustments to their marketing spend. And when your data is skewed, and by skewed I mean you've got fake data from bots, so data that doesn't even represent real users, as well as legitimate data from actual users that are either paid or organic that are being attributed to the wrong source, that, makes, uh, that can cause you to invest in the wrong sources and make the wrong decisions for your product. Now, that's something which we call the bleeding cash cycle, and we've seen this over and over again, where you invest your marketing budget into certain channels, those channels that, uh, and in some of those channels, you might find some fraud, and some of that fraud will either fake really great results, or they will, legitimate, they will poach legitimate users that are actually very high value, for example, your organic users. And so what you end up seeing is that in those campaigns, you tend to get high return on investment. In some cases, as a strong performance, or even better as your organic channels. That makes your marketing team happy, it makes your product team happy, your CEO decides to increase your marketing budget, and then you start spending that marketing budget in the same channels that are um, uh, creating the fraud. Sorry, got lost for a word there. Now going back to the types of fraud, we categorize them into two very distinct types. Number one, attribution hijacking, so these are legitimate users, whether they're organic or paid from a different source, that are being hijacked either through click, in, uh, click injection or through click flooding, as well as fake installs, which are device farms or bots. These are completely faked installs, no real users. Um, and these are the two primary ways that fraudsters get away with it. So we're going to dive into all of them to help you understand exactly how they work, 
And what are the measures that you or your attribution provider can take to be able to pr protect you from it? So starting with install hijacking, um, the way that this works is really by injecting a fake click somewhere in that user's journey prior to an install. And the most common way we see it, which is usually on Android, is malware on that device that can detect when an app is being installed or when it's being downloaded. And it will fake a click for that, um, for that app before the user actually launches it for the first time. And so in this process you see here, you've had a legitimate ad click, a download started, and at this point, malware detects the install and sends a fake click report, and then the user launches the app. Now in a normal scenario without any fraud, the time it takes to see an ad, click on it, redirect to the app store, scan your fingerprint or scan your, your face, download the app, and then launch it, it, it takes time. It can't happen within a couple of seconds. And so a very common way to detect this type of fraud is to look at what we call abnormal click-to-install times or short click-to-install times. That was the more basic uh, way that we and others uh, kind of detected this type of fraud. But we saw that fraudsters started to get smarter. And so we had to evolve how we protected our clients to cover not just these kind of shorter abnormal CTITs, but also looking at, for example, click-to-click -click time. So new types of malware detect when a legitimate ad click has happened, and then they'll inject a click right after that. And so we'll need to look at that distribution of time between clicks, as well as the time between the clicks and the install, as well as other patterns that we see over your entire distribution, as well as looking at your referral data that you get from Google, and referencing that with Google Play Store, um, or on iOS, getting a validation for the install directly from Apple servers, and using all that together to be able to identify this kind of fraud and basically remove that click data from the logic and make sure that, it's, that install is being attributed to the right source. Now the second type of click-based fraud is what we call click flooding. And this is a little bit different because it's more of a spray and pray tactic. Essentially, when you're on, let's say, less savory websites or you have an app that has malware, what it'll do is that it'll just fake thousands or hundreds of clicks for lots of different apps that are relevant for your device in that region in the hopes that you might install that app at some point. And so they will be able to claim that attribution. And so I'm currently in Australia, and if I have an app that is committing this kind of fraud, it'll basically fake clicks for apps like Uber, Ola, uh, Menulog, um, you know, uh, Foxtel, and, and so on. And if I ever install one of those apps, there's a click there from some time in the last couple of days that that install can then be attributed to. Now this is a much messier way for fraud, and it's not as common because it's, it's very simple and very easy to detect. Um, and the way that you can do that is by looking at a couple of different signals, including that click to install time, but looking at a longer distribution, um, for example, over a couple of days, as well as checking your conversion rates and your contribu uh, contribution rate, which refers to your multi-touch attribution. Um, so in general, users tend to click on a single ad and install. In some cases, they might click on two. And in very, very rare cases, they'll click on multiple. Now, if you can identify a single publisher, it tends to have a very high multi-touch rate. So they tend to be contributors in a lot of users' journeys. And you combine that with all these other signals, you can start to see that pattern that this is basically a click flooding attack. Now, moving on to faked installs, um, device farms were probably the most frightening type of fraud that we saw about two years ago. So this, is, this was really a new type of fraud that uh, nobody really knew how to protect against because it was all being done with real devices, real clicks, real installs, real engagements. And then they would just reset those device IDs. And this is where scale of data really comes into place. And so the only real way to protect against this, aside from seeing patterns, uh, for example, if, if uh, the fraudster isn't too, too smart and they're just basically doing the same couple of actions in, in, a, in a very similar pattern and repeating that, you can kind of detect that. But at scale, the way that AppsFlyer works is that we check over a database of 8.4 billion devices, which is about 97% of devices globally. And we use this database to identify whether we're finding a high rate of installs that we classify as new devices. So a new device would be, for example, a device we've never seen before. And this is, it happens. There are devices that, we've, that our technology isn't on. You always have new phone releases. So next year we'll have the iPhone X, uh, X1 and X1S and so on, or later this year. And so we'll always find these new devices. However, when we see kind of an abnormal rate coming from single publishers, 
um, and that being perpetuated across multiple apps across the ecosystem, those are ways that we can then identify that this is a, this is a kind of fraud that, um, that you're exposed to and then put in measures to block those publishers. And lastly, bots. And these are the most advanced types of fraud that we see currently, and this is an ever-evolving type of fraud. Bots don't even require devices. These are completely server-side. And when it started, we really just saw it as a very basic kind of click and install, and we would be seeing these kind of uh, data sent to our servers constantly. Um, and that evolved to also simulate, for example, in-app events, in-app reports. So these fraudsters started becoming more and more sophisticated in that they would investigate your app, understand the behavior that is, that's expected from users, and then try to simulate those as well. So what I want to do as well is tell you, well, show you how easy it is to actually create a bot. And sorry, skip the slide. This is what I wanted to say. Basically, bots being able to do everything from installing, browsing, adding items to your cart, playing different levels, making purchases, all of it looking very legitimate. Now, to create a bot, it's actually fairly simple. Many fraudsters globally are individuals, you know, people who just want to kind of make a little bit of money on the side. And actually, if you go to YouTube, you can just search device farm, um, and you'll be able to find videos of people all over the world, including in the US, showing their device farm and how you can set one up as well and start making some money. Now, for bots, this is how it's done. It only takes about a day to get ready. Um, you usually let it run for 30 to 60 days, um, and you kind of want to change it up and target another app or you know, change up your, uh, your loop. And all you need is really a server, an attribution SDK, preferably open source, so it's easy to read and understand how it works, and so you can mimic the data sent from it. Um, an anonymous IP package from the darknet, uh, one ad network or multiple ad network publisher accounts, and then an abundance of device IDs, which you can create randomly, or you can just buy it off the darknet somewhere. And then what you do is, number one, retrieve your ad URL from the ad network. Um, so this is usually not the case for um, self-reported networks like Facebook and Google who have kind of closed networks. But most ad networks in the world, um, it's fairly simple to set up an ad, uh, an ad publisher account. So you grab your URL. Um, you create fake user agents. So basically, you um, assign like the operating system, the, uh, the device model, the uh, device type, set la device language, and so on. And these are all kind of composed of that user agent. That's what we're going to think is the actual device. From there, you start understanding the user's app and what kind of events need to be replicated in order to make the data look legitimate. And then you randomize that script so that not every single install looks the same. You want to make sure that there is a little bit of randomness in the click to the install time, in the in-app event actions that happen, in the conversion rates. If you're constantly showing 100% conversion rate and install to purchase ratio, that looks really suspicious. And that's going to be very easy to identify. Then you want to take your anonymous IP package and hide, um, hide your server location, um, preferably in a location where you're advertising to users. For example, let's say Australia, if we're targeting Australian apps. And then we start firing those install and AMP events, and we create the loop and profit. And so this is how it works. And for a lot of developers, if they're not protected against this, what they'll see is a massive spike in installs and in-app engagements over a very short period of time from a specific ad partner. And in a lot of cases, it already looks suspicious, but there's little you can do preemptively to then protect yourself if you're not using, uh, for example, fraud protection um, that can do this in real time for you. But, the, but again, fraudsters are constantly becoming more sophisticated and smarter in how they do this. And so a lot of bots these days really try to mimic your actual users. And so when you look at your distribution graphs, you don't see those kind of anomalies in your user's behavior. It's much harder to detect these days. And so this is why you really need fraud prevention at scale and fraud prevention that can evolve with the fraud, uh, with, the, with the way that fraud is evolving itself. Um, and so this is kind of where AppSlayer comes in uh, with our fraud prevention suite. Um, and this is how we've built Protect360, which I'll show you in a second, um, to kind of counter these different types of fraud and make sure that we're constantly evolving to find new types of fraud and create mechanisms to protect our clients against them. So number one, we need device level insights at scale. Like I said before, we have 8.4 billion devices in our database. We measure over 1 trillion actions per month, and that's growing uh, exponentially. We need comprehensive in-app event measurement. So a lot of developers, and not so, not so much for gaming. A lot of gaming uh, studios are very smart with how they measure their apps. But when you look at a lot of non-gaming um, apps, they're not so sophisticated in their measurement. 
And a lot of their KPIs are generally just, let's get more downloads, rather than let's get in-app actions, let's get actual conversion inside our, uh, inside our apps. And in using machine learning at that scale to understand, um, to, well, to analyze those different distributions um, across the entire network, but also down to specific apps um, to, to find those different anomalies, and in providing multiple layers of protection to block all those different types of fraud we spoke, we spoke about and to continue adding more. And what this looks like is this, under the hood, where every install and every click and impression that we track goes through all these different layers of protection to see if we can identify fraud at any one of those points. Um, and if anything gets through, be able to use alert systems um, as well as machine learning to understand what happened and then build that mechanism on top of it so that we can add that to the real-time protection. And a really good analogy for this is kind of like a home invasion. So a basic kind of protection for your home would just be a lock on your door. But a burglar who wants to get in will try your door, find out it's locked, either break in or try the window, which might be unlocked, and he's in. And so when you look at a multi-layer protection for your home, you're really looking at having locked doors. You're looking at um, you know, having locked windows, having security cameras, uh, alert, uh, alarm system, maybe even a dog. And then for a burglar, what they need to do is monitor you and try to understand your behavior. They need to you know, test the door first, test the window. If that doesn't work, watch your actions, see when you go on vacation or go to work, where do you leave your key for your friends? And eventually, once they get into your house, they'll have to mimic your actual behavior to disable the alarm system and so on. So that's very much how this works as well. Now globally, this fraud protection uh, prevents about 6.7, well, up to $6.7 million worth of fraud a day. Um, and for a lot of our clients, uh, this can represent, for example, up to 50% of their ad spend. And this is all because of the, the scale of data that we, um, oops, get this out of there, the scale of data that, that we have. Measuring over $19 billion worth of annual ad spend, 12 trillion in-app events measured annually, and the 8.4 de billion devices in our database. And before I end this, I just want to showcase two clients that um, that use our fraud protection. Uh, one of them has a case study with us, and this one will be coming out next week, so you'll be able to download that and read that as well. And so this is a non-gaming client of ours, Ticket.com, which is one of the biggest uh, OTAs in, or mobile OTAs in Indonesia. And before they started using um, our fraud prevention, uh, they were actually manually analyzing all of their data to try to find those different anomalies and then go and reconciliate um, that ad spend with their ad networks. And that actually costs them over 1,000 man hours annually. So if you think about it, that's, a, that's almost 20 hours a week of somebody's time spent analyzing data just to retroactively understand fraud, go back to ad networks, and try to negotiate, um, negotiate their, uh, uh, their fees. But switching over to an automatic fraud prevention suite also helped them spend 30% of their ad spend immediately in real time, as well as help them see a 20% lift in ROI and a 25% growth in their user base immediately. And secondly, Garena Games, uh, one, of, one of our largest gaming clients globally. They also moved to AppsFire about a, a year and a bit ago. And when that happened, they saw immediately uh, almost 50% of the ad spend was saved through our fraud protection. 50% of the millions of dollars they spent on ads were wasted on fraudsters before they started working with AppsFire. They found five times more fraud than they did initially before they were using us. Um, they saw an increase of 4x um, improvement in their loyal user rate because they could focus on really quality users and stop paying for fraud. And they overall saw a 70% boost to their marketing ROI. So fraud's important. Even though for gaming globally, it represents a very small portion of the pie, fraud kind of evolves and attacks in waves. And any individual studio might be faced with a large amount of fraud at any time. So it's really important that you understand what you're up against um, and also know that there are solutions there to help protect you. So I hope that was useful. Um, I will be doing a Q&A at the pop-up stage, I think, in the main hall, or, yeah, the main hall at 2 p.m. So if you have any questions after this, you can always feel free to come and see me there. Thank you very much.